I'm Michelle Ramsell. I am an assistant teaching professor in the Institute for Society and Genetics. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a game that we have been running in a very large uh, gen ed science and society course that I've been involved with um, for quite a while. Um, and I'm really happy to talk about that in the context of the active learning session that uh, we just went through. And I noticed there was role playing involved, so um, I think that this is a great opportunity to talk about a broader scale kind of um, role playing activity. Um, you may notice when I talk about this activity that I'm talking about a case study, which is about GMOs, um, that is not just focusing on science. Uh, and so I want to introduce to you all a framework for science education, really briefly, um, that's known as socioscientific issues education. And it's a way of thinking about how we can make science education uh, and science more relevant, but also help our students to cultivate um, very strong critical thinking skills um, that really take the idea of scientific literacy and move it forward for them. Um, and so we can obviously think about lots of examples of scientific issues in our world today uh, that probably warrant a socio-scientific perspective that thinks about science in its social, political, cultural, economic, ethical, and so on and so forth context. So today I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, our research question. We've started to collect some data um, on how this role play game is helping our students uh, to meet many of our learning objectives in the course, particularly around uh, core college related skills and self-efficacy, perspective taking, and then more uh, centered around the ideas of critical thinking on socio-scientific issues. Uh, perhaps more interesting to a lot of folks here might also be the question of how do you do this, right? How do you make this work in a large gen ed course format? Uh, the context for this is the Biotechnology and Society Cluster. I know there are some folks here who are familiar with or who have been involved in the Freshman Cluster program. Um, this particular cluster um, is one that I've been involved with for about 10 years. Clusters are uh, cross-disciplinary. We feature cross-disciplinary teaching teams. Um, and our cluster in particular um, has a strong science focus, as you might note. Um, and we have been utilizing uh, a role-playing game in this course for quite a while that comes from something called the Reacting to the Past Consortium. It's a consortium that puts out historical role-playing games. Many of them are used in history classes, but there are a few more science-oriented games. Um, the author presented us with a draft version of this game a long time ago, and uh, it was designed for like a small seminar course, and we really ran with it, we redesigned it, we adapted it to run in a 260-person course in discussion sections, um, and designed a number of different uh, course elements around the game to help students prepare for and carry out uh, their participation. And you can see here, there's speeches, there's participation, uh, there's final position papers, lots of things that our, that our students are accomplishing. The context of the game itself is about a real historical event. So we're anchoring in this in something that really happened. We can do debrief on what actually happened uh, afterwards and provide a lot more context there. Um, a famine uh, that was impending in parts of Southern Africa in 2002. There's a great documentary available that we were able to get uh, through UCLA Library for folks who are interested in learning more. Um, but students in the role-playing activity take on roles representing many of the individuals or likely individuals who were a part of this particular uh, situation. So that would be presidents of Southern African countries, that would be scientists, that would be regulators, local seed co-op representatives, NGOs, any number of different characters who had something to say about this question of genetically modified corn. Uh, and the United States, as the context, was saying genetically modified corn is what we are going to be giving as food aid, right? Um, and many of the countries and the European Union were not so happy or pleased with that. And you have to keep in mind, this is 2002 as well, a, a very different time in our understanding um, of GMOs. So keeping with, I think, the theme of collaboration that we're noticing for here today, um, students are uh, put together into factions. 
and they have to try to convince the presidents to accept or reject the aid, and compromises are possible. Um, so we have a lot of data that we're working through, but I'm just gonna show you a little bit of um, some data from this past year about uh, asking students how much they learn from various elements of the game itself, um, or how the game helps them with a variety of skills. Uh, so these are box and whisper plots. Um, they're uh, filling out surveys um, where one would be a very low score and five would be the highest score. And overall, they're ranking various elements of the game and their learning experiences really highly. And I'd like to point to something that I think is really great, which is that they're very uh, highly ranking their ability to weigh alternative points of view, to collaborate with others, and to compare values and perspectives as a result of the game. We have a lot of student responses that we're also working through, um, but the student responses point to the game uh, helping students with a number of sort of socio-emotional skills and, and self-efficacy skills, as well as content-related skills, uh, related to how they can process and think through the various socio-political, biological, um, and cultural arguments related to GMOs. And I'm not gonna read through those, but um, these might be posted afterwards or additional uh, things. We've learned a lot as well. We've learned that you can do this during lockdown over Zoom, right? Um, surprisingly enough, you can do this in discussion sections where there are only eight people. You can do this in discussion sections where there's 22 or 23, so it's highly adaptable, right? Um, and there are a lot of key lessons that we've learned about structure and support uh, for both our students and especially for our TAs because they're running this in discussion sections, so they need to know what's going on right, in order for this to really work. Um, this can also be adapted to other formats. So I know I'm out of time, but I'm happy to discuss more with anyone who wants to chat later. Thank you.